afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our PIAC webinar on the impact of the COVID-19 crisis. This webinar today will be focused on the impact of COVID-19 on urban transport. As you will see, we have uh, six very distinguished panelists, and I expect the session today to be very exciting. It's also likely to extend longer than usual. It will probably last for two hours or maybe two hours and 15 minutes. So I hope uh, that will not be too much of an inconvenience for you. Some basic rules for our Zoom online meetings. They are here on the screen. Uh, there will be presentations. So I hope you are accessing this session today from a device that allows you to see the visuals, such as a laptop or, or, or a tablet. Please mute yourself, turn off your microphone. Similarly, turn off the video during the presentations so that we all avoid, avoid background noises and connection overload. Very importantly, please use the chat feature of Zoom because this is the way to ask questions to the panelists. We will collect those questions and we will, we will direct them during the Q&A session uh, later. Also, as you can see here on the right side of the screen, please uh, be sure to have your full name and country displayed uh, so that, well, basically everyone know who is who. Uh, it's uh, under the rename uh, feature of Zoom. And I guess everyone uh, will find that. Please in include your name, surname, country, and then uh, click OK. Uh, and if you don't do that, Valentina Galasso uh, is sure to contact you uh, about this. Uh, so, as I said, your microphones and cameras must be turned off. Uh, it's very encouraged that you ask a question, that you raise an issue, or that even you share a practice, you share with everyone how you do things in your country or your organization. To that end, please use the chat feature of Zoom and send a message to all participants. It's one of the options. It's the default option, to be honest, uh, and focus on questions that are specific to roads or road transport. That channel in Zoom is monitored by Christos Kjernofantos, who is the chair of one of our PIA committees. Christos will check the discussions, will raise the questions to relevant panelists during the Q&A. So about your name in Zoom, uh, please make sure to turn off your cameras, turn off your microphone, and also name yourself in a way that uh, enables everyone to interact with you. And by the way, my name is Patrick Malejac. I am the Secretary General of PIARC, the World Road Association. The session is recorded. The resulting video will be shared on our website. Disclaimer about the content of what we will discuss uh, today. Uh, it's likely that what we'll discuss, knowledge, praxis uh, today, will not have been officially approved by each country's uh, official uh, authorities. So I invite everyone to turn off your camera. Thank you very much. So the ideas and examples shared here uh, today are for illustration only. They do not necessarily represent official policy. Uh, well, the crisis in many countries started a few months ago and it's been too, just too quick for policy uh, makers to design official policies. So ideas presented here will be subject to further evaluation. We've taken great care in the preparation of the material, but no responsibility can be accepted for any damage that may be caused. The key concept indeed is to focus on the short term. So it's a crisis and every day counts. So we've decided at PIARC, as we usually do, to share knowledge and current practice. It's urgent. The idea is to support responses to the pandemic in near real time knowledge and current practice that may not have been yet confirmed as valid or effective, and what works in some parts of the world or in some organizations may not be relevant elsewhere. But we are deeply convinced that PR got inspiration can be found anywhere. And a good idea now could help you save lives, could help you improve your business resilience, and could help you minimize disruption of services. In parallel, we're also planning medium and long-term actions uh, and we'll talk about that later in the conclusion of this session today. At PIAC, we've set up a response team, uh, 10 experts, I would say, from different parts of the world, different backgrounds who have decided to team up forces and who have made themselves available uh, to create 
this series of webinars and the documents that you may have seen on our website already. The agenda on the structure uh, uh, today, sorry for the X here, uh, I will start with a brief introduction to PIARC and to the structure of issues that are faced by road operators and administrations. We will have uh, six uh, presentations from panelists. Uh, they will present that themselves and we will conclude by a question and answer and next steps. Our speakers today include uh, Tommaso Bonino from Bologna in Italy, the Public Transport Authority, Li Zhang from the USA at the University of Maryland, André Brotteau, uh, who is based in France and who is at PIARC, the strategic theme coordinator for our theme number two, mobility. Andrea Simone, who is from Italy and who is the chair of our technical committee on mobility in urban areas. Karen von Klosen, secretary general of the police network and Dionisio Gonzalez, uh, from UITP, where he is Director of Advocacy and Outreach. We're very happy to have Karen and Dionisio with, with us today, uh, because they will bring the perspectives from their whole networks and organizations. Thank you very much, Karen and Dionisio. So I will start with an introduction, and this is me here on the screen, uh, if you were wondering who is speaking. Uh, so what is PIARC? So PIARC is the new name of the World Road Association. We were founded uh, 110 years ago, uh, 1909 as a non-profit, non-political association. Our goal is to organize exchange of knowledge on all matters related to roads and road transport. That's the mission, that's the vision of our members, that's what we have been created to do. Uh, that in turn leads to four key missions. The first one is to be a forum for analysis and discussion of all topics related to roads and road transport. That's what we are doing now actually. Uh, the second one is to notify, develop and disseminate best practice and give better access to international information. For example, when we share video recordings of the webinars, when we publish reports, and you may know that we publish on average one report uh, per month. The fourth mission is to consider within our activities the needs of developing countries and countries in transitions, transition which are sometimes called low and middle income countries as well. They are involved in our committees we organize seminar, seminars in those countries and we specifically ask them what are their needs when designing the terms of reference of our working groups. Uh, the fourth key mission is to design, produce and promote efficient tools for decision making. Uh, this includes QRAM, which is a uh, software that helps uh, decision making about uh, transportation of dangerous goods in tunnels and HDM4 that many of you are probably familiar with, which helps with decisions about uh, investment planning and maintenance planning uh, for roads projects. How do we do that? We mobilize the expertise of our members. We have 124 member countries. We have hundreds of more of additional members from private sector, public sector, academia, industry, uh, all over the world. And our operations are guided by a four-year strategic plan, which you can find on our website. So what are the issues faced uh, by road operators and administrations uh, with the COVID-19 crisis? So we have found that it was very useful to structure the situation around six key issues. Uh, they are here on the screen. The first issue is to ensure your employees' health and safety. I would say this goes without saying. Uh, this is a primary concern for every employer, but it particularly applies to road operators who have uh, front-facing uh, uh, customer service type of personnel, such as toll booth operators, for example. Issue number two is how do you maintain activity and business continuity? Well, roads have remained open during the crisis. Uh, that's really something that has to be noted. So how does that happen? How do you make sure that you have employees on the ground or employees maybe working from home and that still make it possible to open, or open the roads to man the toll booths, to maintain the roads, to answer customer requests, etc. The third issue is to analyze the impact on transportation. Many countries have seen a sharp decrease by around 90% in some cases of traffic. Uh, this has led to some important business decisions. Uh, some countries have seen, uh, um, I would say, complex impact on road safety. Uh, Decreasing, decrease, decreasing in traffic means fewer accidents, but also uh, fewer traffic means some uh, drivers have found it interesting for them uh, to speed, and that has led to serious accidents. 
Issue number four is business relations. You need, you have partners, you have suppliers, you have customers. How do you maintain all of that in a way that is as professional as possible and as sustainable as possible? The fifth issue relates to customer and stakeholder relations and joint working. That in particular includes liaising with all the authorities that have been mobilized and who have given directives in this crisis. The sixth issue relates to secu security and in, per in particular to cyber security. Uh, when uh, most of your uh, workforce is working from home, how do you ensure that all these networks remain safe? Those issues were presented in more detail during our earlier webinars, and you can find them also in our notes. We have indeed produced two synthesis notes. Uh, they present the emerging findings from the first webinars. They are relevant for the rural community and be useful for you to inform uh, your decisions about planning and operations. Uh, and they are available from our website. They are available for free in English, Spanish, and French. I invite uh, all of you to download them and to, well, hopefully uh, you will find them useful. So this is uh, the introduction. Let me just uh, add that, again, that questions are very welcome. Please uh, use the chat feature in, in, in Zoom, uh, ask questions, make proposals, uh, suggest topics that you would like to address, Anything is really is really open. This is carefully uh, managed by Christos Kizofontos, one uh, of our key members of the response team at PIARC. And without further ado, I will uh, now invite uh, uh, Tommaso Bonino from Italy uh, to uh, well, open his microphone and to uh, give us his presentation. Thank you very much. And I will be available, of course, uh, for questions about PIARC and others uh, later in, in the session. Tommaso, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. <clears throat> In Italy, we are entering afternoon. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to be part of this webinar today. I hope you can hear me fine. Very fine. Uh, I want to thank Andrea Simone for having introduced me to PR in the last year. The title of my presentation deals with the face more than one because phase two was, uh, in my opinion, too much limited as a concern. So uh, next slide, please. I work in Bologna, in Italy, as director of SRM, which is the public company who is responsible for organizing sustainable mobility services in the metropolitan area. And the area is uh, little more than one million inhabitants. On a personal level, I'm a member of the UITP Organizing Authorities Committee of the Feder Mobilità Comitato Tecnico, which is uh, an Italian association among regulators, and of the PRC International Committee, Mobility in Urban Areas. SRM is also a police member with the city of Bologna. Next, please. I won't be talking about economics because this is not the place, but I would be unfair if I didn't at least touch the task. So I'm uh, borrowing some words from London, from the mayor of London, and ask you to read them later. I just want to underline the uh, TFL talking about unprecedented financial crisis dealing with public transport these days. So London is often taken into consideration as a good practice, not may maybe best practice when dealing with public transport management. And I want you to read these words by the mayor in order to grab the terrific relevance of the financial aspects of delivering public transport during and also exiting the COVID-19 lockdown. Depending on their coverage ratio and on their debt level, among other uh, figures, companies are suffering and will suffer at different levels. Bologna in Italy, it, it, as, as Bologna is concerned, income from fares is above the Italian average. So we have, uh, let's say, major problem with that. Next, please. Now I'm coming to Bologna. Bologna is where the little circle is in the middle of the Pianura Padana dealing with historical pollution big issues. And on the left you see before, on the right you see during lockdown. 
uh, now of course we are experiencing the situation post lockdown next <coughs> what is new since the last meeting we had it was the beginning of april the lockdown definitely pushed urban mobility down to zero many data have been shared newspapers have gone crazy in order to give a measure to our immobility not all the data providers have shared good information this on a global scenario to go on a local scenario next one please uh, these are the data from the city of Bologna and data on a local level is fundamental. Here you can see the figures. I don't want to go into detail, but you can see that uh, they are all quite similar, but of course a little different. And when you go from minus 90% to minus 70%, the difference has some meaning. What is from, why, why is uh dealing with data fundamental because phase two has to be planned and monitored on a sanitary basis of course but also with reference to the sector we are dealing with which is mobility okay and we already grabbed some important tips. public transport for example has lost much more users than cycling cycling again has already shown sort of a recovery in the last days of april higher than the one of the private cars. Next. When I say planning, I mean this. On the left, you see the data we used to design the sump. On the right, you see those same numbers reconsidered on the basis of the survived essential mobility when dealing with public transport. 53% of the workers still worked during lockdown and 34% of them were on smart work. This was meaning mobility for work was fallen to 35%, the number you see on the top right. Not all the jobs are the same. For example, shops, finance, real estate professionals, public administration, those, uh, let's say, located downtown are using more public transport. Others, like for example, agriculture, productions, health, school, use less public transport. When I say school, of course, I do not say students, I say people working within schools. The estimated reduction comes out to be 88%, because 2200 compared to 18800 means minus 88%, which confirms the numbers we have seen before. But be aware that in the peak time, the reduction is only, let's say, only 80%, and the capacity of the system has fallen to 25%. If teams, of course, are available for phase two and for the following phases. Okay, next one. Sanitary distancing is not over with phase two. With phase two. I would like to say sanitary because social might result in heavy and dangerous outcomes, but I, I guess you have read some articles about that and so on. Two examples here. You have uh, Tel Aviv in Israel. You see two demonstrations held in the same square, the second one uh, some weeks ago with social distancing. And the second is Rimini in Italy last year and during lockdown. Next. Moreover, historically, urban mobility has increased with GDP. When you suffer with GDP, you can foresee some kind of reduction in, in the global amount of urban mobility. Considering an expected GDP fall by close to 10%, please take a look at what's happening in Shenzhen in China and uh, it, what is, is planned to be happening in London passengers won't be returning to 100%. They will probably line up to 85, 90% for quite a long time. Somebody says 100% will be reached in uh, 2023, but I don't want to give too much uh, importance to this, even if uh, by saying it again, again, it's, it's coming true, let's say. Next one. What about model split? 
this slide on the left has become quite famous all over Europe in the last days, in the, in, in the last days, because they say the private car is going to explode in use in urban areas, doubling its share. Public transport, public transport is more than halving, and cycling is being quite stable. But please consider the title of the study, which is Impact of Coronavirus to New Car Purchases in China. So points of view and legitimate uh, interests may be, let's say, sometimes misleading. Also consider when thinking about model split and the comeback to selling many cars, what this brings will bring in terms of security on the streets. Next one, please. Social sanitary distancing in public transport is a very, very serious matter. As the restrictions began, begin to, to be lifted, the public transport is facing practical operational heavy challenges. Sanitary distancing in public transport is very critical. The mayor of London already underlined this stuff before. On one side, the World Health Organization says social, social distancing has to be made. Crowding has to be minimized. On the other one, operators are very committed in trying to obtain a sort of an exception. You see Madrid on top and Hong Kong in the lower part, in, in the lower part of the slide. It's a very big challenge. I'm quoting UITP. I prepared this uh, slide collection before knowing that Dionisio was with us. So please do not consider this as a, I don't know the English word. Next, please. This is what uh, matching public transport and sanitary distancing means. You see the results of two online real-time surveys among 140 participants at one of the UITP webinars held about COVID-19 in the last weeks and months. The one on the left means that an average of 35% of the original capacity, capacity is estimated to be left to be available in phase two. The one on the right means that 85% of the attendees see distancing on the bus is almost impossible to be respected. And my personal experience in the city of Bologna in the current days uh, has to confirm this. Next slide, please. So what's happening in phase two? On board the public transport vehicles, we will have segregate, segregated drivers, specialized doors, specialized seats, no cell, no info given on board, personal protective equipment needed, air conditioning probably not working, disinfection provided every day. Some issues anyway are left. The segregated driver on buses is not just justified if passengers are allowed to respect, not to respect sanitary distancing. Different on a plane, different on a, a train, different on a subway uh, vehicle, but on the bus, passengers do see the driver and vice versa. More, who controls? You only have the driver on board. Can the driver skip stops if the bus is to be considered full? It's absolutely not easy to answer these questions. Next one, please. You see some details in here. Sanification is made in the depots. Here you have a picture of Ancona in Italy, but the problem is that not all the vehicles do sleep in uh, depots every night. So it's not that easy to uh, provide these kind of operations. Segregation of the driver, this is VN, makes some space not available. And when I say some space, it's, let's say, some space. And space on vehicles, as a result, because of space management, as you can see, is very poor. The, the one left is very poor. Next one. Uh, still, this courage of usage made by operators themselves, I choose London, as you can see, as a, as a recurring example. Information to the public is given. The, the one in the center is Milan. 
temperature measure measurement is taken and signaling on vehicles is made. This is Singapore. Next one. Public transport, of course, is not the only mobility in urban areas. What else to face the COVID-19 phase two is made? Cities can invest on infrastructures. Here you can see the plan for Milan, who's mainly investing on cycling. Then on the, on the right, you can see uh, Berlin and Bogota, where cycle lanes are popping up on a one day realizations. Be aware that shopkeepers already are fighting that as, uh, as usual. In Tirana, they say they will build in five days as many cycle lanes as they have built in the last five years. Not only, you can uh, also contain private traffic by shaping streets, especially the local ones. Uh, next one. But since the real goal has to be behavioral change, infrastructures are, um, are sorry infrastructures are important but rules are important as well i would say even more rules can be immediate and made almost for free some politicians do already know here you can read what the deputy mayor of barcelona declares uh, other measures of course consider personal protective equipment for city users but also uh, reserving streets for special categories of vehicles can be made. You can see San Francisco on the top right. Or regulating alternate license plate circulation, for example. The one uh, that the picture is made in, in Rome, but some years ago, where the goal could be to be flat, to, to flattening the rise of trips by car and boost, uh, for example, car polling. Moreover, which is very interesting. I can't read German story, but Germany performed a major streets and traffic laws modification in favor of cycling in some days during the lockdown. Uh, next one, please. So, okay, rules can be transformed for urban mobility not only within urban mobility. Some major examples might be uh, regulating the times of the city. Everybody's saying that, but it's very difficult to be done. Here you can see the uh, Valladolid in Spain plan for uh, city time modifications. Mobility management and mass in the operation of the companies, but and, and also Bluetooth tracing for spread awareness, of course. Technology can be an emergency solution, but it has to be dealt with as a step to future sh uh, scenarios as well, mainly, I would say. Somebody could also think about increasing the price of gasoline, for example, which is lower than average so far. Next one. I'm going to conclude my presentation and I'm going back to some economics. Market capitalization of companies is suffering a lot and the transport is one of the worst sectors, recording a minus 20%. Of course, air, insurance, recreation, hotels and so on suffer even more. As you can notice, public administration is not there because it is not measured by market capitalization, but uh, public ad administration, of course, is suffering a lot. Where, where would you put public, trans uh, sorry, public administration within this chart? This is a challenging question. Uh, I'm not, but I'm not closing with the question. I would, uh, you would ache this, I know that. Next slide. I close with this one. Perfect. Thomas, you have about one or two minutes left. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm closing. The Emmer and Dance one. It, it, so it's called the alternation between phases that we will probably live in the coming weeks and months. I think that to beat the, the COVID-19 pandemic in a way that also protects our mental and financial health, we need uh, optimism to create plans and pessimism to create backup plans. 
We need a combination of measures on a local and global basis, and we have to be prepared to perform some specific ones among them, or all of them, depending on the conditions that we are living in. When, uh, when you face the Rubik's Cube, you don't know what you will be doing in the following moves, but you know that you will solve it somehow because you have a range of available measures you can choose among. The same kind of organization, in my opinion, you have to give to yourself uh, as a plan of action. Next one. I thank you for your attention. You find my email address should you want to bring forward this confrontation. And of course, I'm staying here for the question and answer session later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Tommaso. And again, uh, if we have uh, questions, everyone, please use the chat uh, feature of Zoom. Uh, thank you, Tommaso. Uh, Lee, uh, I invite you to uh, now to uh, join us and to uh, uh, deliver your presentation. Please unmute your microphone. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, um, Good morning or afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Lei Zhan. I'm a professor in civil engineering at the University of Maryland uh, in the US and uh, director of our Transportation Institute. So it's uh, my pleasure to join this uh, PIKE webinar to share some research and work. Our team, which is a very multidisciplinary team of engineers, public health experts, as well as economists working together to look at the impact of COVID-19 on transportation and, and other aspects of life. And we've also put together an interactive impact platform. Uh, you see the URL data.covid.umd.edu. And this platform is being used by uh, a lot of agencies at federal, state, and local levels, as well as the private sector. Uh, I would like to share with you uh, what's the data and method behind the platform as well as some of the results on the impact on mobility as well as if i have time you know some of the other interesting findings to share that with you uh, so it's more of a u.s perspective uh, a little bit of background so our institute has been running you know arguably the largest transportation and mobility data center in the u.s for the past 20 years. Uh, so we actually do not collect our own data, uh, but we get data from all kinds of public and private sector uh, sources. We fuse the data, analyze it, visualize it, then provide data analytics, visualization and research products now to more than 12,000 government and corporate users uh, everywhere in the US. Next slide, please. And the particular data, you know, we're using here, you know, as you've seen from the Italy uh, presentation, as well as used elsewhere in the world, is really uh, mobile device location data. Uh, in this case, from you know more than half of the mobile devices. Uh, so we worked with five different uh, data aggregators. Then we actually fused their data together, clean it, to be able to understand mobility patterns travel behavior and uh, other metrics of COVID-19 impact uh, in, in the US. Next slide, please. Just very briefly on the methodology we're using to process the data because mobile device data is good. It, it you know, has large sample size, it's continuous, it's almost near real time, but you know, there are also issues with uh, this kind of a data set because one, you do not see all the devices. And uh, even if you see some devices, you don't see them every day. Even if you see a device, anonymize a device on a particular day, you don't see all the trips. So there are all kinds of uh, issues that need to be dealt with before you know, we can comfortably draw conclusions and support decision making based on this kind of data. So in the past four years, you know, uh, my institute, you know, we've been leading the mobile device data pilot project for the U.S. federal government. And we've developed a set of algorithms to clean the data from different sources uh, to identify activities, trips, devices that are staying home. Uh, then we also have a suite of algorithms that impute 
information that's not directly observable from mobile devices, such as uh, the purpose of the trip, as typically defined by planners and the transportation modelers. Uh, imputed travel mode, this is all kinds of travel mode, uh, air, rail, bus, driving, walking, biking, and others. Uh, then we also try to impute social demographics without uh, violating privacy protection, uh, looking at income, gender, and age primarily. Then we combine all the trips records together, weigh them at a multiple levels, at a trip level, device level, to be able to expand from this already big but a very biased sample to the online population. Uh, then we integrate all the travel data with data from public health, with economics uh, data from federal agencies to create this integrated data set to analyze the impact of COVID-19 and monitor this impact over time. Next slide, please. And, and this is, so this is, uh, uh, you know, I, I cannot do a demo of the platform, but if you go to the, uh, uh, a website, I would encourage you to do so. Again, data.covid.umd.edu. Uh, you will be able to essentially be able to monitor uh, a number of metrics, including mobility and social distancing metrics that we've developed from this kind of data and also validated, as well as uh, public health data, economic impact data, uh, some computed by our own groups, some of the data we uh, aggregated from other research groups and uh, agencies. So the idea is to be able to provide information on mobility, social distancing, public health indicators, economic impact indicators, vulnerable population indicators, all in one place so that decision makers, the general public can all see uh, this uh, comprehensive impact very quickly with one or two clicks. They can see how their state, so this, this data is provided and computed for every state and every county. Uh, we have more than 3000 counties uh, in the US every single day. Uh, they can see how they are doing over time on specific measures and how specific measures for, for a particular state or county compared to established reopen, reopening a gating criteria or threshold values, how they are doing compared to the rest of the nation, how they are doing uh, over time right, in terms of uh, travel and other perspectives. Uh, we, we've got, you know, I, we, we've got our 15 minute of, of fame, uh, a lot of coverage in mainstream media here in the, in, in the US, which also led to a lot of uh, actual users uh, everywhere in the nation with this platform. Next slide, please. And so just to show you, so this is the result on aggregated results of social distance index that we developed from all the mobility measures. And uh, I guess the, you know, one interesting finding in the US, so what you see here is for every single day since uh, February until the end of uh, May, how well each state is doing in the US on social distancing and and so you will see the wide ranging difference. Uh, we 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 never went to eighty percent or seventy percent of reduction in mobility like uh, we observed in some European countries. So in the U.S., people don't like to stay home, uh, even with government orders. Red means no social distancing at all. Uh, blue means a lot of social distancing. People are staying home. They're making fewer trips. They're making less interactions with others. And, and the, you know, in, in states like Washington, D.C., Hawaii, New Jersey, New York, my state, Maryland, you know, we are, we are doing pretty well. But even in these states, we're only seeing about a 40 to 60 percent reduction in mobility. But when you look at other states, like at the bottom of this, Wyoming, North Dakota, Arkansas, and, you know, some of these states, at this point, mobility in these places are pretty much back to the pre-pandemic um, um, state. And, and even, you know, I have, if you look at number four called quarantine fatigue, uh, this is where our platform got the most coverage in the media, is that after Americans stayed at home 
for about a month, uh, many decided that's enough. Uh, even with shelter in place, stay at home orders still in place, many people just decided they don't want to do it anymore. Uh, there, there are different reasons for it. I don't have time to go into the details, but that is just a interesting uh, finding that I want to share that uh, uh, the mobility just goes back even when government still says you should stay home and, and many people just decided not to. Next slide, please. And, and you can find statistics, you know, uh, you know, 38 different metrics, right? So here I'm showing working from home. Percentage of people who actually worked from home based on our algorithm and computed for every state and county. And, and again, it's, it's very different uh, state by state. Uh, I do not want to uh, go into details on this, but you can see all of this on the platform. Uh, next slide, please. And one tool we provided, so this is, this is interesting, I wanna share with all of you is, what is the role of the researchers, right? So um, the, the, when we talk to federal, state, local governments who are using the platform, and uh, you know, many wanted decision support, but, but they do not want too, many, too much decision support for them. Uh, they wanna make their own decisions, uh, and many consider this uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily, necessarily saying that I completely agree, but I can see the point. Many consider when to reopen, how to reopen as a political decision, as, as a trade-off between taking a risk on public health and uh, looking at economic impact, uh, both in the short term and long term. So what we do is we provide a tool called Society and Economy Reopening Assessment that allow them to very easily see the important, you know, uh, you know, 16 out of the 38 metrics that uh, our team considered as the most important for them to consider when they decide when and how to reopen their states and uh, counties. Uh, but uh, they actually do not want anybody to tell them how to do it. They, they, they like data, but uh, they want to make their own decisions. And in, in the U.S., different states. And in some cases, even different counties uh, are making their own decisions on when and how to reopen, which also creates a lot of uh, mobility issues. Because when you start opening one state, one county, and not the others, uh, that tends to attract a lot of people traveling from areas that are still under lockdown to these areas that have reopened, potentially creating this, this mobility flow of people from hotspots with a lot of uh, infections right now to places that have reopened, otherwise pretty safe. And we've been monitoring that as well. Uh, next slide, please. And um, with the time I have, I want to also share just, you know, as much as I can, given the time, uh, some actual use cases of uh, our platform. Next slide, please. Uh, so at the federal government level, so for instance, the U.S. Department of Transportation is actually publishing uh, our results as, you know, the daily trips by different distance bands. What we've seen is uh, VMT and uh, person miles traveled, vehicle miles traveled uh, decreased for all, all kinds of trips in all the distance bands. Very short trips, long trips, they've all gone down. But what's interesting is we, what we found out was that uh, right before, uh, just at the beginning of the pandemic, that we, which was uh, mid-March in the U.S., there was actually a huge increase in very long distance trips, longer than 200 miles or 300 kilometers. And so, so that actually shows a lot of people when they saw the outbreak, they decided to actually leave where they live and go to somewhere else. They basically fled away from hotspots or decided to go home. Uh, so that was actually a, a, like a panic uh, and a huge increase of long distance travel at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, but right now, as I mentioned, the mobility is, is back in many places. Uh, so in the US, it, it came back very quickly. And, and the Center for Disease Control in the U.S. Is, is integrating the mobility data and social distancing data into epidemic models for predicting future cases at death. Uh, Department of Veterans Affairs actually use our tool 
to help determine when to reopen their facilities in specific states and counties. Uh, there, there certainly is a lot, a lot of interest using mobility and transportation travel behavior data to analyze economic and financial impact. So our data is also used by the US Department of Treasury and the Federal Reserve Bank, as well as a number of uh, large financial institutions to help them analyze uh, financial prospects and impact. Uh, in the U.S. Uh, in different lo localities. Next slide, please. And so here, you know, is the actual travel distance. So number of trip reduction and the number of trips in the U.S. nationwide. Uh, we have this data for every state and every uh, every county. As you can see, uh, the very dark green bars are pre-pandemic February. Uh, March is when we started having the pandemic. April is when we had the lowest level of mobility in the U.S. In May, things are coming coming back, right? So you can see uh, the trends there. But again, we are only looking nationwide. We're only seeing about a 25 to 30 percent reduction in travel distance uh, in, in in the U.S. So not as uh, significant a reduction as in some other countries as we compare the results internationally. And, and in May, it's coming back already. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Lee, you have about one or 10 minutes left. One, one minute? One or two, yes. One or thank two, you. okay, so I'll, I'll move more quickly on these. So there is also a lot of change in activity participation and time use. Uh, so for instance, we saw that for shopping trips, people are changing when they do shopping. Uh, instead of in the afternoon, they're shopping more in the middle of the day or in the morning more. And, and they're doing fewer shopping trips, but they're spending more time now uh, for each shopping trip in the store. Uh, so there is a lot of interesting activity, participation, and uh, time use uh, changes in behavior. Uh, next slide, please. And, and you know, visits, some of them come back, uh, visits to financial institutions are slowly coming back, but visits to, educate, to schools, education institutions, still remain at a fairly low level because schools are still not open yet in the US. Uh, next slide. I, I do want to be able to, so I'm gonna skip the slide. So we do a lot of external travel monitoring. I will skip this, this slide. Uh, you know, we do out of state travel and all of that and correlate out of, you know, the travel mobility pattern with the, tra you know, with the, the, the transmission of viruses and the new case outbreaks in the nation. We, we're tracing that out. Are using different models and there is a lot of very high correlation between travel across the state borders and COVID cases in the U.S. We're tracing that out. Next slide. And some, some other in, very interesting application is that we're using the data to, to help agencies every single day monitor conformity with social distancing when they reopen. You know, for this county alone in Maryland, Baltimore County, we help them monitor more than 6,000 locations every single day uh, without violating privacy uh, for data use agreement. So we look at the trends of visits to these and, and give them warnings based on how many people travel, you know, visit these places and where they come from. If they come from places with, with a lot of infections right now, then the risk level is higher at that location. We will give that warning to agencies so they can go in there to do more disinfection, or to enforce social distancing. Next slide. Um, I'll skip this one. This is basically some details on that and how we predict uh, the risk of new outbreaks and give that information to government agencies. Uh, next slide, please. And, and the other thing the mobility data can do is not individual level contact tracing. Uh, in, in the US, most states do not have enough house workers to do contact tracing, you know, find out who has contacted or being in close contact with an active positive case and ask them to quarantine themselves. We do not have enough people to do that. Uh, but we are using data in a way that can give community level, aggregated level contact tracing to, uh, to using mobility data and provide suggestions on which localized areas can be you know, quarantined uh, after reopening. So we don't have to go between either reopen, every, reopen everything or shut down everything in the entire state. 
we can do more localized uh, strategies to deal with this reopening process in the U.S. Uh, next slide. Um, and, and we're also working with our economists, uh, including uh, former commissioner of U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and the former chief economist in the U.S. Census Bureau, who are right now uh, both my faculty colleagues at the University of Maryland, to combine mobility data and uh, you know, some economic data and survey data. Uh, the issue is economic data and survey data at the federal agencies is that uh, the, it takes a long time for them to become ready. Uh, and the mobility data can do is give them more timely information on economic impact and uh, financial impact. Uh, next slide, I think I'm almost done. Yeah, I think you need to bring the presentation to a conclusion, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, next slide really you show the changes in consumption that we estimated from mobility data and other data sources like credit card use data to show that. And this is, this is my next, this is my, my last slide, right? So now we are also looking at travel by different modes and try to monitor that, uh, especially with an interest in, uh, in, in public transit. And we're also looking at in integrating the mobility data, travel models with epidemic models uh, to provide decision makers more granular uh, tools that they can look at different kinds of travel restrictions, potential uh, travel policies as they try to help the nation, states, and different counties recover from this. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you for, uh, for your time. Thank you very much, Lee, and sorry to have uh, rushed you a little bit. Um, and again, everyone, please don't hesitate and ask questions uh, to Lee or to Tommaso in the Zoom uh, chat channel. Our next panelist is André Breteau from France, who is one of our theme coordinators in PIARC. So André, if that's okay with you, I invite you to uh, turn on your, your microphone and uh, to first start. Thank you. Good morning or good, good afternoon, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have no, no slide to present myself. My English is not so good. So, sorry. My name is André Broto. I am the coordinator of Strategic Team Mobility and uh, the president of uh, the French branch of Piarc, called Piarc France, of course. I am also working in a French company called Vinci Autoroute, which is a concessionaire of highways. Next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, the summary. Uh, first, I will uh, explain why I said uh, my perimeter is transport in large metropolitan areas. Second, the idea is to see what could happen in the middle, uh, uh, in the short and middle term. And therefore, it is interesting to know what was the situation in France, of course, before, and what were the trends concerning mobility. Then we will look uh, what happened now, what could happen tomorrow, and what about the role of uh, strategic team mobility. Next, please. Why transport in large metropolitan areas? Two reasons, two mainly, two main reasons. First, urban areas cannot survive without their interland. They need goods and workforce coming from not only the peri-urban areas, but also from rural areas. And second reason, reason, people living in peri-urban or rural areas need an efficient access to the services delivered by cities, jobs, education, culture, welfare, hospitals, universities, and so on. Therefore, all those people use, coming from peri-urban, rural, or cities, use transport facilities within the urban area, and we cannot split uh, the origins of those people. Next, please. If I take an example, for example, Paris is uh, 86 square kilometers plus 20 square kilometers of uh, forest and 2.2 million inhabitants. In the map, it is a very small orange area in the center. But the Ile de France region is 12,000 square kilometers and 12 million inhabitants. It is the uh, yellow and green area around Paris. And the commuting area is bigger than the Ile-de-France region. Next, please. So what were, what were the mobility trends in France in the last decade? Next. Well, uh, on the left, you have the relationship between the gross national product 
and uh, the mobility um, all modes in within France, uh, excluding international uh, airplanes trips. So during uh, mainly ten years, the relationship between uh, the cross national product and mobility was very tight, very strong, and since uh, let us say eighteen years. Uh, there is still a relationship, but it is not so important. We had in that period two uh, national inquiries concerning transport, one in 1994, another one in 2008, uh, concerning all national transport modes. We have a lot of data, and it is interesting to look uh, just two points. One concerning short daily trips, that is to say less than 80 kilometers, and the second one, what happened for long trips, more than 80 kilometers. So on the right side, on the top, you have uh, some figures for the mobility trends, daily short distance trips. It appears that in 14 years, the distance per person and per day increase of 9%, the average length per trip of 10%, and the number of trips was the same. Therefore, we can summarize the trends on that period for this type of trips by a single uh, phrase, more far. People were going a little bit more far every year. If you look now for what happened for the long trips, the distance per person and per year increased of 15%. The average length did not increase. The number of trips per year increased of 15%. Per, uh, 15 and, the num and the duration of the trip, the number of nights outside of home decreased from 60 of 16 percent. Therefore, we can summarize this very simple: more often and less time. Next, please. Next slide, please. Uh, no, no, uh, no, 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 uh, no, no, no. Go back, go back. Yes, this one. If we look what uh, happened, for example, for daily trips in the Ile-de-France region du during the period 1975 up to uh, 1999, uh, the figure, the color, gives the average distance of uh, people living in one uh, community to go to work. And if it is white or yellow, those people were doing an average less than five kilometers. It is, if it is red, it is 15 or 20 or more kilometers. So you can see uh, in 25 years that people were going to look, to, to look for jobs every time more far. This is in relation to what, what we said, which what we said in the past slide. Next, please. There is other trends we can summarize quickly of transportation in France. The model split at a national level, and despite the policy driving a strong priority, giving a strong priority in investments in favor of public transport since 2006, more or less, and at a national level, there is no change in the model split for passengers and the worsening of the model split for freight. There is more and more lorries and less and less trains for freight. If we look now at the cost of mobility only for daily short trips, we have an increasing cost of the private car for the user, due the, to mainly to the increase of the cost of gasoline, and in average, a decreasing cost of the public transport for the user, but an increase of the cost of the public transport for the city's budget. Last trend, uh, a lot of projects are abandoned due to an increasing lack of public support. Next, please. If we look, for example, the model split between trans public transport and private transport among motorized trips only, the color gives for the Ile de France region 80% uh, in the center for Paris in favor of public transport, of course. And uh, exactly the contrary in the periurban area, that is to say 20% for public transport and 80% for uh, cars. This is only for motorized trips. In France, we have uh, the public transport is very concentrated in cities. 
the cities are very nice, it's not downtown. Uh, the cost of the housing is very high in the cities, so there is a concentration of assets in the cities. Therefore, the benefits delivered by public transport are concentrated in city centers. Next, please. As a consequence, in France, we had uh, an, an increasing lack of social equity and protest. I don't know if you will say yellow jackets or yellow vest, but we had a very strong protest. There was also tip, uh, similar protest in Chile and in other countries in the world. Next, please. I uh, have a, here a copy of a slide presented by uh, Andres Monson de Caceres on the PIAC webinar of the 5th of May. Uh, he said we had in Spain the economic crisis in public transport during uh, six years between 2007 and 2013. What was the impacts of the economic crisis? A triple loss of, in public transport, an increasing of urban sprawl, an increasing of car dependency, and of course, an increasing of economic, social, and environmental cost. Well, here we have, we, we, we have the same trends, of course, in France. Here we have some general trends, the old situation. And now I suggest, next slide, please, to look uh, what happened in France between lockdown and reopening. The reopening in France started on May 15. The principle of the reopening was uh, very cautious, getting the economy back on track without triggering a second outbreak. So uh, we were very cautious on all measures. Next, please. And uh, here are some figures given by the Thierry Marais, who is the CEO of a French uh, important public transport company called Transdev. Uh, he, he gave the following figures under the distancing constraints. The capacity of a bus is reduced from 80 passengers to around 20 passengers. The offer of transport during that period was in between 80 and 100 percent. The operating costs were bigger due to sanitary constraints. And the demand was around 20 to 30 percent. And of course, as a consequence, there is an important gap uh, between the revenues and the cost, operating cost. For, for the whole uh, cities having public transport in France, it is forecast that the revenue losses of public transport would be would reach four to five billion euros. The main reasons are the following: less demand due to unemployment, remote work, etc. The distancing measures and reduction of bus and train capacities, sanitary measures, and uh, as a consequence, an increasing of operating costs. Next, please. Lockdown has shown us that we can change our habits, and that is interesting. For example, we have uh, the boundaries between home and work or between home and purchase or business have shifted. This is an opportunity to modify the traffic demand, at least in the peak hour. We could have less trips in the peak hour. On the other hand, we ca it can lead also to an increase of urban sprawl and an increase of the long distance trips. Due, to, for example, to remote work, people can say, well, I will stay at uh, 40 kilometers from the city and I will uh, go to work only two days uh, per week. So we don't know what will be the most important effect. The understanding that freight is important for cities is better. This is important because uh, a lot of projects uh, failed because of lack of social uh, agreement. But now, a lot of citizens have understood that freight is very important, of course. We know it, but uh, it was not generally uh, accepted. This is an opportunity, for example, to optimize logistic investments in relation with big urban areas. The understanding is also better for uh, concerning the increasing lack of social equity. 
a lot of citizens have understand the importance of workers coming from outside of the cities now. This is an opportunity to re-equilibrate the offer of public transport and or the cost of mobility for the users between the city centers and the peripheries. The willingness of cities to develop active pedestrian and bicycle facilities is better. And the facilities of rural communities, the willingness of rural communities to develop carpooling is also better than it was. And of course, uh, this is open to discussion. Next, please. For example, uh, a lot of cities have developed temporary facilities for bicycles very in a few, uh, just in a few days. Next, please. Well, what could we say concerning the middle term? Next one. We, I think that COVID-19 is an opportunity for replacing old ways of doing things by new ways. And of course, this is a French case to discuss. For example, develop remote working and other benefits of digital transition, develop bicycle services, path and financial support, reallocate public transport services from very short trips, a few kilometers in the city centers to medium distance trips in peri-urban areas. For example, in France, in many cities, the average distance of trips by bus or by tramway is below three kilometers, which is very slow. Finally, those modes of transport are competing with bicycle, which is not uh, the best uh, idea. Uh, focus on multimodality, we lack of multimodality uh, equipment in France. The idea is to transport, of course, more and better with the existing public transport network and the existing road networks. Change maybe the policy of public transport fares from a flat system. We have in France, uh, in the cities, a flat system. You, uh, when you, 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 you pay, you pay for, for example, one month of using the public transport and you pay and you can travel as much as you want. And of course, this is not a good signal for the user. It would be better to go to a system you pay as you use, etc. Next one. For example, uh, the CEREMA has published guides to promote cycling and uh, to test temporary facilities and a guide, uh, it's uh, in free access. Next one, please. What about the role of ST, of strategic team two mobility? Next one. Well, uh, during the launching of uh, the next cycle in Paris, we said, we showed the, that uh, slide, we said, let's always keep in mind the broad goal for community. Transport policies, on top of transport policies, there is broad goals for the community, and the roads and road transport fields are constantly evolving in response to those broad goals. Climate change, of course, extreme weather events, urbanization, social expectations, and of course, uh, we have a lot of constraints on financing capacities. Next one, please. Today, I should say that social expectations are more and more important. We should focus not only on vehicles or roads, but on people needs and expectations, including uh, sanitary expectations. Focus not only on traffic demand, but on people mobility, all modes demand. Focus on changes in mobility trends and people behavior. Focus on trends of public support to new transportation policies. Uh, those remarks are especially important for uh, two technical committees one is mobility in urban areas, and the other one is mobility in rural areas. Of course, all this is for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, André, uh, for your presentation, which broadens up the scope of what we can discuss. Uh, and we're very happy at PIARC, the World Road Association, to uh, be involved in such uh, discussions. Uh, I invite everyone again to ask questions or, or and use the chat channel in Zoom. Our next speaker is Andrea Simone from Italy, who is one of our committee chairs. Uh, Andrea, welcome, welcome. You have about uh, 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you.
Hello to everyone. Good afternoon. Did you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Okay, sure. Perfect. Perfect. So, you know, I met Jared, the PR Technical Committee 2.1, and I want to start from what said Andre to everyone. He said that it's important to start from this new post COVID crisis response in order to also adapt the way that we can see that we have to design and to maintain an urban area, urban road for the future. Uh, I'm an old engineering, so I'm an engineer, so I want to obviously analyze and focus on road and technical guidelines, but also I want to try with this presentation also to introduce a new way to say for the future, how it's possible to have a better development for the future for our urban roads and, and urban mobility. So next one, please. Uh, what happens uh, in Italy from 8th of March to 4th of May? We have the lockdown, empty road, uh, quiet road, no noise, no pollution, no people in streets, in parks, in cinema, museum, and so on. So sure, is a sure something that we have never experienced before. So everything we know about our urban world and urban road has come to a shadow all. Uh, after 4th of May in Italy, what happens next? Next, please. Next. After 4th of May and until uh, yesterday, sorry, today, because from today it's possible in Italy to travel from one region to the other. So after 4th of May, we have a uh, urban life that will begin in, uh, in order to uh, reach the rhythm of our work, leisure, shopping, not, uh, not all of the, you know, education because also school and university are also closed nowadays, but we have new uh, uh, life, and also urban roads becomes and we have the traffic increase some of the data that we have in italy was shown by uh, by thomas before uh, i want to put one and uh, one question to everyone so which is the future for our city which is the future for our uh, urban mobility we have to follow only the growth we have to follow or we have to follow the quality of life or the sustainability sure we have already made some answer you try to think sure to uh, um, answer to the maximize if it's possible the investment but also to purse growth but also it's possible if it's possible to maximize the quality of life for all so generally the answer will not be probably uh, only one and it's possible to find some uh, answer some to this question in order to obtain a balance between this uh, climate and a problem and also a healthy and safe moment. Next, please. During lockdown, we have a, experienced a real time laboratory. So uh, we are full of learning SM, and probably is the same not only in Italy, but also is the same also in Bologna. This is some picture taken from the city center of Bologna, but also we have uh, some example of this obviously all over the world, not only in Italy. So streets with fewer cars probably show to us, to people, that it's possible to live and to travel and to use the urban roads, the transport in a different way. So probably it's possible to think, to obtain more, if it's possible, mobility services and public transport that could be less car dependent in the future. Next, please. One possible answer, it's not only one. I understand that it's impossible in 15 minutes to analyze all the possible solutions for the future. And also probably it's possible also to uh, uh, analyze all the possible uh, solution of the cubic, uh, uh, Rubik, sorry, the Rubik cube that showed Tommaso to us. So one possible problem after the coronavirus emergency. One possible problem is probably, I don't know, um, increase in the car use with the increase of urban road occupancy, or increase of risk for all users, and probably also an increase in air and noise pollution. One possible solution, one possible solution is soil pollution that we have also tried to develop and to design in the past, and we want to also use in the future for probably the uh, post-emergency COVID it be also the key to see in a different way also the sustainability travel modes. Next, please. What happens in Italy? In 19 May, we have a one day law that was called Relaunch Italy. Uh, there, where we have um, approximately, uh, it's typical in Italy, uh, uh, 300, three, 
300 pages of uh, articles, but we have also two articles connected to mobility, for mobility, and problem connected, sorry, and solution probably for, for uh, public transport commuters. So we have a specific uh, specific mobility bonus equal to 60% of the expenses of, to buy bikes, e-bikes, and let the scooter, the maximum for this bonus is 500 euros. And I want to underline that uh, the first answer for all the people that live in the municipality, in the center, and that a lot of people try to use this kind of bonus. And also we have the queue in the shops to buy e-bikes, bikes, and so on. There is also something connected to the road code, the law that regulate the use of a pedestrian and bicycle path. We have a new uh, definition of cycle lane. Nowadays in Italy, it's possible to have cycle lane together in the same carriageway with no difference in the with only one uh, horizontal sign in order to build up a very quick way, a continuous path for bicycle is a big change for us and also advanced house of lanes for bicycle at intersection. We have also some changes regarding the role of the mobility manager. Mobility manager is a figure that already be already uh, be part of our regulation, but we have also new uh, role for school mobility management in schools in different kind of companies also association and finally some i hope so very useful we don't have now the uh, final part of the decree so i don't can say to you which kind of protective music will may be made for railway and public transport commuters but we connected to what i said and reboto about the possibility to be increase the use for public transport for the people that they have uh, to travel more than five kilometers. Next, please. Some data. Uh, we have started from two years ago in Italy, a new sustainability mobility plan. And so we have already a different plan for Milan, Bologna, Florence. Here you find six different cities in Italy that we have a, a phase one. So before the lockdown, um, in a network, sorry, a bicycle network that there is from uh, uh, 200 kilometers to uh, 45 kilometers. We have a new sustainability mobility plan for bike lanes that uh, range from uh, uh, 900 kilometers from Bologna to 400 kilometers to Milan and so on. So, uh, starting from 4th of May and also starting from the new decree law, probably we had to build up new lanes for the principal itinerary. And I want to say to you that starting from 4th of May, there are a lot of work that are going now in, uh, in our city, not only in city center, but also in the peri-urban areas and also in the metropolitan areas. Next one. I show you uh, some examples. So after 4th of May, post lockdown, we have new lane, new works, uh, not only uh, a uh, new horizontal sign that to identify pedestrian and uh, bicycle path on the carriageway, but also new bike lanes with specific itinerary for in, uh, for in Bologna. We have a project to, for, for 493 kilometers, 60% of them it will be built at the end of the 2020. In Milan, we have 35 kilometer project, 22 kilometers under construction now. And in Rome, we have 25 km, 24 kilometers under construction. Sure, it's not a big, big uh, uh, network, but it's a big change in our, uh, in our country. It's a big change. Also, because I want to remember that in Italy, 80% of trips uh, take place in the city with, uh, with a five kilometer radius. So, but a few people use the bike. in. Uh, in this 80% of trips, in Bosnia we have the 30% of the 80% they use uh, a bicycle. In Bologna, nine, ten percent In Milan, nowadays, seven percent. In Rome, only one percent. Next, please. So, what happens? We have a new so-called open road project in Milan, Strade Aperte Open Roads project. They start from 4th in May. Uh, is also we found reference of this project in all a lot of international uh, newspaper and also site. This is the the picture I take from the Guardian, and it happens. So nowadays uh, we have 22 kilometers that are completed uh, until uh, July. You can say, and also 
you have to remember that on average in Milan, the inhabitants travel four kilometers to go to work. So it's possible, is and also a much shorter distance compared to large European cities. So it's possible to use this post-COVID emergency to try to change the habit. What I can say to you that in Milan, we have a change in habit. We have the first uh, results uh, of data. We have a big change in habit, approximately from 40 to percent of the people that uh, answered to a form that, I be, uh, that in, uh, in Milan said that probably they changed, they not use a private car, but use public transport and probably bicycle to go to work. So it's possible now to, to, try to work in order to change also the behavior, not only of the commuters or workers, but also for education. So, uh, sorry, perfect, next, next, perfect. Next, please, so we have some example is the, Corso Venezia, Venice Street uh, in Milan. Before, on your left, we have a very, very common two-lane carriage. So one carriage with one, uh, with, uh, one lane in each direction, and also uh, very large with also high speed, no bike lane, no parks, no pedestrian. Sorry, we have the pathway to our the right and left, four meter length. Uh, on after now it was uh, going to build after we have uh, only one lane for each direction with the reduction of the dimension of the lane park on the left and right and a specific space in the carriage that are only for uh, pedestrian and bicycle users next please for Corso Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires Road, we have, and also you find the picture in Corso Buenos Aires probably all over the world because you have um, also the major uh, sale of, um, of the Milan city municipality that uh, post this uh, photograph and also this project in the tweet, uh, in a tweet, and also you find this kind of picture that I find also in the technical guidelines from Milan. So before what we have, we have, two lane in each direction, only for cars in Corso Buenos Aires with high speed from 50, 60 kilometers per hour, but also more, uh, obviously connected to the traffic that you find, and two park lane in uh, each, um, on the left, on the right. The new idea that was built in these days, only one lane in each direction for the cars, park on the left, on the right, and also safe place for pedestrian and bicycle users on the left and on the right. Thank you, next please. The last two Milan is an example that we have from uh, Piale Monza, Monza Road, is in the, near the city center, not is a road that is going to be um, for period, we call it the periurban area. And we have before only one, sorry, one lane for each direction, two carriageway, sorry, two carriageway, two lane for each direction and the park on the left and the right. After the now is going to build, we have an in, the only one uh, lane for each direction, and in the uh, in the future we have also the park on the left and on the right. Thank you. Next, I want to show also something about uh, the Bologna project. It's called Open Roads. They also it's called it, there is anger for space, you need space for uh, pedestrian and bicycle users. This is an example, sorry, is the first example is taken from Stalingrado Road near the uh, city center. There's a main road that uh, comes from Ferrara and arrives to Bologna. They uh, have a lot of traffic and we have a change in the dimension of bicycle and pedestrian pathway. So only a change on the space and a specific lane for both. Thank you, next. For Saragossa Road, Saragossa Road is very, very near the Faculty of Engineers, so I know very well this road is a change. Before we have a two lane, one for, uh, for, for buses, only for buses, and the other for bus and cars. We have a change because we have to add a specific pedestrian, sorry, an increase of pedestrian space, and also a specific new path lane uh, on the right. Thank you. Next. You have about one minute left, I would say. Thank you. Yeah. One minute. Perfect. I finish. I finish. Perfect. Uh, this is another example where in Toscana Roadway we have an increase of space for bicycle users. And the last. Thank you. Next. 
is the last from Bologna, when we have an example, the change with the increase of the space for bicycle users, pedestrians, on the left and on the right. Thank you, next. I want to show only some final picture on different kind of work that was made, not only in Bologna, but also in Milan, but also in, in Padua, as you say on the right, specific line, bicycle lane that was going to build in a, a can say a, a road that brings to the city center in Padua. And in the left, you find an example of a Sant'Orsola hospital. So a new bike lane that travel across, the travel through the Sant'Orsola area, hospital area. Thank you, next. Uh, you find that here the first work was made in Rome and also in Turin for the uh, specific household for uh, bicycle users at intersection. The final conclusion, next please. In conclusion, is I want to put this question for you, for you and for me also, if it's possible to create livable urban road that would probably could increase the, I hope so, in Italy, I hope so, the active travel networks in order that if you have the infrastructure, I'm sure, and also we have some data about it, if you create new and also useful, uh, new and also easy to use walking and cycling infrastructure, probably if you have the infrastructure, also you increase the use of them and they have a change in the habit of the people, specific in, in our situation when we have, you know, the big cities, Rome and Milan, it's not so big if you compare to the other city in the world. And finally, some words about uh, the thing that you have to um, obviously need more space available for pedestrians, cyclists, but also don't forget various forms of micromobility that we might think about for the future. Thank you, and I want to thank you again for the organization of this very, very interesting uh, meeting. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea for uh, these examples and these ideas, it's really welcome. And we really have to share notions and perspectives on how we want to address things in the future. Uh, uh, please ask questions to Andrea in the chat. Uh, there's a slight change of schedule and we'll move on to uh, Dionisio Gonzalez, uh, who is from UITP. Uh, thank you, Karen, for having been, uh, for being flexible uh, about uh, the, the, this. Uh, Dionisio, I invite you to turn on your microphone and uh, to proceed. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, for you, your kindness, as always. Uh, I, I, I had to leave in, in, in some minutes. Uh, first, let me uh, congratulate uh, Pierre and Patrick for this, for this webinar. I, I am enjoying a lot. It's a pleasure for UITP taking part in this, in this interesting uh, event. And uh, I'm happy to, to see uh, um, some of the slides from my colleague uh, Tomaso. So I will focus on my, my let's say, my th those minutes and the points that haven't been covered yet uh, from from previous speakers that uh, um, uh, bring very very uh, useful and very interesting uh, uh, insights into the discussion. Uh, for us, for UITP, the point is of this of this. Uh, crisis is, 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 we see that as, uh, as an opportunity. Yeah? So the idea is uh, how to take advantage of this, of this crisis. Of course, this is, uh, as some of the speakers already mentioned, we have been launched into a, into a massive proof of concept. And we have been pushed kind of to the, to the base of the Maslow's pyramid, but this also brings some opportunities, or could bring some opportunities, because the question here is, what type of cities do we want to live in? What type of cities do we want to uh, work in? Yeah. Uh, and uh, next, please. Next. So just to give you a bit of context, uh, this is the situation in, in, in Madrid, where I live, uh, during this uh, pandemic, and how the different public transport systems, the different public transport modes, uh, went down up to 10% uh, of the daily demand, while the supply, the offer, was maintained by the uh, Public Transport Authority in levels around 85-90%. Next, please. 
So this health crisis is really having a major impact on public transport systems. Public transport is a vital public service and the sector has been ensuring mobility of essential workers while protecting staff and customers. This is quite relevant. The, the, the ratio of infected people working in public transport in many countries is below the average ratio for uh, citizens in that region. Uh, and this could contribute to the discussion on the chat uh, on the uh, role that public transport networks could play or not play in the uh, dissemination of this, of this infection. It's, uh, it's really true that despite those efforts, the sector is under attack. Uh, it's, uh, there is a permanent threat on, 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 on public transport systems. And I would say even very confusing messages. Yeah? Some politicians that have been really supportive of public transport are now uh, struggling to say something in favor of public transport or even recommending not to use public transport, which is really strange and brings us back to 25 or 30 years ago. So we are working on two main aspects. One is to uh, develop and uh, define with the government's exceptional financial measures. Otherwise, the, the system will collapse and we have to flatten also this, this curve. And of course, you can't, put, you can't put other global challenges in quarantine. I mean, climate, health, social inclusion, road safety, everything, every, all the aspects that we have been discussing and we have been um, fighting for in the recent years are still there. They didn't disappear with this crisis. Next, please. Next, please. So we are working on different uh, messages and I will be very quick on this uh, because you already know them very well. But uh, since mobility is not an end in itself, we are positioning public transport, for public transport as an enabler of other more strategic city objectives. And I'm sure that Paul will, uh, will uh, dip in, into this message. Uh, afterwards. So from the economic point of view, in terms of accessibility, in terms of jobs, um, there are 13 million jobs uh, in, in the public transport sector. For every job in the public transport sector, there are 2.5 uh, related jobs and, and indirect jobs that are created. And uh, there is a recent study by uh, the International Labour Organization and the United Nations saying that if we double the investment in public transport, we will be able to create 5 million additional uh, jobs. In terms of uh, social inclusion, of course, no one is more uh, inclusive, no one is more accessible than public transport. And it's a clear uh, commitment uh, from the sector to leave no one and no place and no place behind. And from the environmental point of view, it's, it's the same. I mean, there are uh, 8 million premature deaths per year due to air pollution. If we would like to maintain this uh, level of ambition regarding climate, we have to cut global emissions by 7.6% every year in the next 10 year. And of course, you know very well about the situation in road safety. There are 1.2 million deaths per year, 25,000 in Europe. is like a, a plane uh, crashing, cr crashing every three days in, in, in Europe. Yeah? It's always difficult to put figures into these uh, uh, questions, but it's affecting uh, summing up both deaths and injuries, 3% of the global GDP uh, lost in road accidents. So this health crisis is really a, a window of opportunity for bold decision makers. Next, please. Next, please. So as I was mentioned, next, please. Um, we are working on two different aspects. One is uh, the economic and financial impacts of COVID. 19 on the on the sector with uh, different uh, um, time schedules in the short term, in the short, medium, and in the medium long term. Uh, developing some different surveys with our members, authorities, operators, and, and industry in hundred countries all around the world. Some of the results of these surveys were already mentioned and shown by by Tommaso. But just to give you an example, last week we had the meeting of our policy board with 100 members uh, of uh, CEOs of companies from the, different, uh, from the different continents. And one of the questions was, how many months would you be able to survive 
without any support, without, without any financial support from your governments. And the average was around six months. So it's only six months the time we have to really uh, uh, develop any type of mobility fund or recovery uh, financial measures in, in, in at global level. Second question of one of the another another relevant question was how many time would you think that will uh, will take to recover the demand pre COVID? And 85% of them said more than one year. So in line with uh, Tomaso's slides uh, before. So we are assessing a number of initiatives, working with the different uh, local, regional, and national governments, and also, of course, with uh, multilateral financial institutions, helping them and, and working together to define the best response and recovery strategies to be applied, uh, putting uh, public transport uh, as a backbone of urban mobility. Next, please. Next, please. Next. So it's, a, it's a, a very good opportunity to move forward on sustainable urban mobility. And we should come back to the basics for this. We know how to develop these this sustainable urban mobility strategies. There are four main pillars. One, one the first one, you, have, you should have a strong common vision, working together at all levels of the administration and all departments within the city, uh, mobility, land use, of course, uh, housing, social aspects, health, all together rethinking uh, cities for people. The second point is you need an effective governance and a modern regulation. You need public transport authorities. You need uh, integrated transport and land use uh, authorities working on these type of uh, long-term strategies. And of course, modern and, 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 and proper regulation. Uh, in one of the studies that UITP developed some uh, years ago, uh, we identified as one of the main barriers to develop sustainable urban projects, the lack of uh, proper regulation. There is a, always a rigid, very rigid like, regulation that doesn't allow to advance quickly on those, on those topics. Of course, uh, and this is particularly relevant, we need solid and stable long-term funding and business plans. Uh, of course, not, in, not only in the short term, but in the, in the long term. It's impossible to plan any investment. It's impossible to plan any service if you don't have what will be your budget next year or next two years. This is super relevant in, in, in all developed and undeveloped uh, uh, countries and, and, and societies. And of course, we need, and we are working on, on this with different associations, including, of course, our friends of, of Polis, on developing ambitious political leadership and, and, and that helps us to convey the key, uh, the key messages. How many strategies have failed due to the lack of, of a captain? Yeah? Thank you. Next one, please. Next. So just to finalize uh, some, some recommendations and, and, and some conclusions. We can't just come back to, to a new normal. We should come back to a better normal. Yeah? Uh, and that really requires a very good communication and trust into public transport services. I mean, what, what has happened in the last two months is, I would say, even unacceptable. Yeah? Uh, we have been investing in public transport for many, many years. We have been investing in open streets, in healthy cities for many, many years. We can just um, uh, forgot about it in, in, in two months. Meaning that we should invest and keep the investments in public transport, making public transport as a, a priority. It's, it's a very good moment to develop uh, tactical urbanism uh, projects to recover more and more space for people, meaning walking, cycling, and of course, public transport. It's also very relevant to ensure that there are clear rules and enforcement by competent authorities. And there, there have been also some questions in the chat regarding this. What about the distancing? What about the masks? Why, why, why are they compulsory in some cities? Why are they not in some others? And, and these type of things, it's, it's really important to follow clear rules. The sector is ready to help. We are part of the solution, but we need clear rules and, and enforcement by, by competent authorities. It's also quite relevant to involve public transport experts. Yeah? We have seen during the last weeks also, many instructions, many decrees by competent authorities saying that you have to do this, you have to do that this is the maximum occupancy level this is a maximum 
distance, etc. It's important to, to involve the, the, the sector to ensure that those measures that are kind of uh, endorsed are really uh, feasible and viable from the technical and from the operational point of view. It's quite important also to uh, work on the uh, travel demand management, and I think we are learning a lot on, on, on that. There have been um, significant changes in, uh, in the, uh, the time of the trip along the day. Many trips are not taken in the peak hour. We are really managing to flatten the curve, not only because less and less people is, is, is traveling now, but also because people is traveling at different times. Yeah? And we have to adjust our network, our networks and our services to, to, to this. And again, uh, it's a very good opportunity to develop a stable institutional and funding framework. This could help a lot. This will be the, 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 the key element of a, a sustainable roadmap for cities and, and, and countries in the different parts of the world, because this could also help also to formalize many of the informal uh, ways of transport that are taking place in different parts of the world. That's all by my side, I think. Next one, please. Yeah, next one. I thank you very much for your attention. There are some reference there for you for your consideration, and uh, looking forward to the to the debate. Thank you again to Piak and to Patrick for your kind invitation. You're very welcome. Thank you, Dioniso, and thank you for sharing those references uh, with us here. Uh, people will be able to access them uh, from our website and from yours, of course, uh, afterwards. Uh, our next and last panelist uh, is uh, Karen uh, from uh, Police Network. Uh, Karen, if you're ready, and let me just add again that questions are very, very welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yes. So, yes, going back to my slides. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are, or good evening, maybe. Uh, so I'm Karen van Kluyze from the Polis Network, which is a European network that you will see on the second slide uh, of cities and regions working together on uh, urban transport innovation and sustainable urban mobility. Um, next slide, please. Yes, um, so it's clear that what happened to us over the last couple of months, that there was no recipe for this disaster, that there was no roadmap or guideline that cities could turn to in terms of how to keep things moving um, in our cities and regions and how to secure uh, basic mobility services in the midst of a very severe um, crisis and resulting lockdown. Next slide, please. What we did see, however, is um, that cities were really stepping into the front lines. We have been taking stock at that polis of the emergency responses in the field of mobility during uh, the lockdown period, first of all. And uh, we saw, of course, that this health crisis is being tackled in our hospitals, but at the same time, it was also being addressed in our streets and plazas, on our buses, on our trains and subways. And we have to say that we were impressed by the immediate action uh, of our cities and regions and making sure that basic mobility services remained in place. Next slide, please. As has been highlighted by uh, the previous speakers as well, the question is now, what is next? Of course, we don't want to go from lockdown back to gridlock. Uh, we have this health crisis that we are facing and feeling very acutely at the moment. But that doesn't mean that all the other crises that we were already dealing with prior to COVID-19 have magically disappeared. There is the, tech, the, the climate crisis that we need to tackle. There are the road crashes on our streets that we need to address. There is air pollution, there is congestion, and all of these uh, challenges that we had been looking at already prior to COVID-19 have not gone away. So we have to be very careful in how we we um, shape the post lockdown period and also on the longer term how we reshape uh, urban mobility for the best and in a way that it tackles all the challenges that are surrounding us. Next slide please. And this brings us to a whole list of opportunities as well as threats that are being brought to us by uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And it's clear that if we want to capitalize on the opportunities, this will not happen naturally. This will not go automatically. So we will have to be very proactive in making sure that we 
don't waste a good crisis, let's say, that we try to uh, capitalize on the good things and mitigate the bad things that could also come out of um, the period that we are in at the moment. And when we talk about the opportunities, I think the threats have been mentioned several times by the others already. When we talk about the opportunities, then of course we see the redistributed space, the active travel boom, the cleaner air, um, the congestion that magically disappeared and so on. Next slide, please. So how are cities coming out of the lockdown? This is a question that we asked our members in the membership survey that we uh, launched. And we see uh, when we look at the results that there are a number of concerns, of course, but also that they believe that increased walking and cycling is something that will stay with us. But at the same time, of course, not to be neglected is the negative impact on public transport and the fact that we definitely need to tackle that as was already mentioned also by Dionisio, for example, and by Tommaso. Next slide, please. What we have noticed is that those cities that have been acting really fast in the current crisis and have also uh, done this from a long-term perspective and with a long-term vision and with increased chances of lasting effects are those cities that actually already had sustainable urban mobility plans in place. So long-term visions, integrated packages of measures that were already looking at how we can make our mobility in cities more sustainable. And what they have been doing in the current situation and within the current crisis is fast track a number of measures that were planned anyway for the years to come and they are now being um, implemented at an incredibly fast pace and speed so in a way shorter time frame that then was initially envisaged and the fact that they were in the pipeline anyway of course um, makes it uh, possible for those measures to also remain uh, in place permanently next slide please so the elephant, in, no, uh, back to the previous slide. Yes, no, the next one. <laughs> Yes, the elephant in the room uh, is, of course, uh, the car and the space that it has been occupying in our cities um, for many generations now. And the massive drop of cars on our roads during the lockdown period made it very clear in a visual way how massive this space actually is that this mode still occupies in our cities. We had very wide, almost empty car lanes during the lockdown and at the same time, very narrow, if any, uh, bike lanes as well as pavements where uh, people did not have enough space to secure social distancing. So this became even more clear than, than, than in the past. And in the background here, you see um, the, the, streets, the street space of Milan, where highlighted in red, you see the streets that cannot guarantee uh, in, in sufficient space for uh, safe physical distancing for pedestrians. So as you can see, there's quite some work to be done in that respect. Next slide, please. So as was already mentioned by previous speakers, what has been happening uh, during the lockdown and continues post lockdown is that cities have been massively respacing their streets, introducing residential zones with reduced speed limits and priority for pedestrians and cyclists, uh, new cycling streets, pop up uh, emergency bike lanes, widened pavements. Uh, and so basically a full reallocation of the street space has been uh, going on with impressive examples from Rome, for example, with 150 kilometers of, of bike lanes, Ile-de-France, where they fast-tracked um, the uh, very wide uh, regional city network following actually the, the logic of the RER, so the regional public transport network, uh, with 650 kilometers of cycle paths being introduced at a faster pace than initially planned. Um, also in Brussels, there are additional cycle lanes being introduced in Berlin and so on. There are many examples that we can mention. Next slide, please. But also, as was extensively uh, addressed by the previous speakers, there is the uh, severe challenge that public transport is facing, both in terms of reduced capacity, uh, as well as in terms of uh, confidence and trust that needs to be restored. Um, so we cannot deny that public transport will be facing and will continue to face uh, a challenging time um, in, the, in the coming period. And that's why also emergency bus lanes, for example, have been introduced and are being introduced to make sure that at least buses have that competitive advance, advantage to uh, the private car, for example. Next slide, please. So looking at this context of, on the one hand, um, 
reallocating space in, face of, in, in favor of active travel. On the other hand, um, the additional challenges posed to public transport. I think there are a number of triggers for change that could help us to make something good out of this crisis. And in the next slides, I will uh, show a bit more about these uh, three triggers. So the first one are life-changing moments. So what behavioral change uh, experts have always been telling us, mobility experts, is that if we want to uh, try to change the, mo the mobility behavior of people, we have to look at life-changing moments. But because it's in those changes in life that people are the most prone to change deeply rooted habitual um, behavior. And that's, for example, when you get married and you move house, when you have children or when you change jobs, those are moments when maybe also your mobility could be changing. Next slide, please. So the question is now whether COVID-19 could also be such a life-changing moment. And we hope that it's actually the case. So you saw people rediscovering or discovering cycling as a mode of recreation, if only to keep physically active during the lockdown, for example, or as an alternative to public transport. So if that could help to make these people move from recreational to functional cycling on a permanent basis, that would already make a big difference. We see, for example, that the average commute in Milan is less than four kilometers, which means that the switch to walking and cycling is a feasible option for many people there. And uh, for that, of course, to happen, we need to make sure that those life-changing moments which can help uh, people to change their habits, that they are accompanied with the right infrastructure measures as well. Next slide, please. A post-COVID-19 mobility survey that was carried out here in Brussels uh, says that indeed people expect that their mobility behavior will be changing. 43% said that it would change. 35% said that they would intend to use the bike or the e-scooter more, for example, whereas 29% feared they would use public transport less. Next slide, please. So coming back to my point about uh, the fact that the changes in behavior, of course, need to be accompanied by um, infrastructure measures that make this possible, I would like to highlight uh, my second trigger, and that is that currently we are actually in the middle of the biggest sandbox ever. We have this opportunity to experiment, to pilot, and we know from other experiences that piloting and sandboxing can really help uh, to go from temporary first to permanent measures afterwards. Because if you let people experience something that they are initially opposed to, their hearts and minds can be won more easily. Just to give a concrete example, of the Stockholm congestion charge scheme, for example. Uh, the cities where they did a referendum about the congestion charge, of course, they all got no as an answer from their citizens. In Stockholm, they did it differently. They first trialed the scheme for six months so that people could see the impact on the city, and then they did the referendum, and it was past. So reallocating street space, taking away space from the cars is a very controversial uh, decision and politically very sensitive decision. But the unique opportunity we have now is that people can experience what it's like uh, to live in such a city where such measures are being taken. And that's temporarily first, but it will increase the chances of citizens acceptance to make these measures permanent afterwards. Next slide, please. And then we have been talking for many years already about the need for an integrated multimodal sustainable urban mobility system and mobility ecosystem. And now with public transport facing a challenging time, more than ever, we will need sustainable modes to carry each other, to reinforce each other and to complement each other, to avoid a massive return to uh, the private car. But this will also require closer cooperation between public and private mobility service providers. Next slide, please. So if ever there is a unique momentum for joining forces between these public and private sectors, it is now. And now more than ever, it is up to the privately driven uh, mobility services that have been entering our cities over the last couple of years and sometimes also in a disruptive way. Now more than ever, it's for them to prove their value to cities and to show that uh, they can play a meaningful role also in supporting public transport. Next slide, please. At the same time, we saw that these privately run mobility services during the lockdown were hit hard as well by the crisis. And at the same time, it revealed the weaknesses of an industry that largely has been living on venture capital and was actually still looking for a sustainable business, business model. So we, we knew that market consolidation was bound to happen anyway, but it's now happening way faster than we could have expected. And some of these services will just leave the market and will not return uh, uh, post lockdown. But at the same time, we saw that other 
members also try to prove indeed that they can play a valuable role by offering free trips to essential workers, for example, or by stepping in and, and helping restaurants deliver uh, meals um, to people's homes. And this was often done in, um, in partnership with cities. So I think those were um, mobility service providers who were very wise to show their potential value while others just pulled off their fleets from the market and I think missed a very valuable opportunity that way. Next slide, please. So what we need to do now is really um, make this integrated multimodal sustainable urban mobility ecosystem a reality. We need to integrate public transport and shared mobility so that we can take away the pressure from public transport and that we can spread capacity and shift travelers to shared bikes, e-bikes and e-scooters, for example. So actually we need to adopt a broader definition of what public transport is or could be and embrace this mix of a mass transit, which remains of course the backbone of an urban mobility ecosystem and then shared mobility services to fill the gaps and to complement public transport. And as I mentioned, this requires public private partners partnerships and cooperation and clearly we will need to look at new business models and and maybe subsidies of, of uh, part of these trips so that we also um, make sure that there is an interesting and viable and long-term business case for these private mobility services to survive and data and mobility as a service can help in that respect to really come to this integrated package of measures where different modes can be combined in an easier way next slide please so hopefully what we can accomplish is a big happy family and there are some uh, examples popping up uh, already which are hopeful to share. So we see that, for example, the whole crisis um, that we are in at the moment is also prompting the UK to rethink its legislation when it comes to uh, e-scooters, which so far were forbidden uh, in the UK. So they are uh, anticipating pilots now sooner than they were initially planning to do. We saw that there is a consortium of startups which uh, is now looking at how mobility as a service could also uh, include new features to take into account uh, crowding on public transport and social distancing, for example. So this could become an important decision factor in, um, in people's choices for one uh, mode over the other. And then, of course, we want them to still choose sustainable modes. We see that new partnerships are being built between uh, railway operators, for example, in this case, the Swiss Railways and VOI um, e-mobility um, uh, e-scooter company um, in Zurich and other Swiss cities. SBB is doing this and, and was already doing this prior to the crisis to make um, the first and last mile uh, complement their own services and as such to also make their services more attractive. And these partnerships are now being continued um, post lockdown as well. And then we see others like Donkey Republic, which is a privately um, operated um, bike share scheme, uh, offering also opportunities to, to cities to set up bike sharing in, in a very short period of time. So can bike sharing become the fourth pillar of public transport is a question we should ask ourselves next to metro, bus and, um, and, and um, tram. Next slide, please. So all this to illustrate that I do believe that we will be bouncing back from this crisis. Cities have shown that they can act fast in times of emergency. Public transport has proven again that it is an essential service that we can rely on even also in the midst of, um, of the lockdown. Active travel again has shown that it deserves more space in our cities and that we should give it that space. And cities will show their resilience. I'm, I'm optimistic about that. But of course, as I also mentioned at the beginning, this positive change will not come naturally and we will need support from other levels of government, whether it's national or European and actually both, but also from the private sector to make this happen and to turn this crisis on the longer run into a positive uh, mobility story. Next slide, please. So just to highlight a few um, references, we have a page on our website called Keeping Things Moving, where we um, keep track of the responses of our cities to the COVID-19 crisis from a mobility perspective. So you're welcome to visit that page for a lot of concrete examples. We also have been running a series of post-lockdown uh, mobility uh, webinars where we also share interesting cases um, in, in, in terms of how to uh, capitalize on, on the current situation in favor of sustainable mobility. And finally, I would also like to invite you to submit an abstract for the annual policy conference 
conference, which is scheduled for the 2nd and the 3rd of December. We hope it will be a real physical conference, but we will see how things develop, but there will be a conference in, in some format in any case. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen, uh, for this, uh, in this perspective, actually, and the initiatives that can serve uh, as examples and as uh, inspiration. So let me circle back to, yes, this is another time to enter the questions and answers part of the session. And I hand it over to Christos, who is the chair of uh, our committee 1.1 at PIARC, and who works at the Department of Transport in Rhode Islands in the USA. Christos? Thank you, Patrick, and uh, thank you to all of our uh, panelists for the excellent presentations that uh, uh, we had today. Um, our apologies for running a little bit late. Um, we have a lot of great questions from our audience here as well. So we'll try and uh, get to as many of the questions as possible. Um, trying to keep it for the next half an hour at least and see how we do with participation at that time. So um, our first question um, will go to uh, Tommaso, uh, please. And Tommaso, one can hope that the COVID uh, crisis will be more or less sol uh, solved soon and will be moving into the next stage. If so, how can we foresee whether these changes to public transit will remain or will just be temporary? Well, we are seeing many, many changes in public transport. I hope the good ones, the, the ones who go towards sustainability, uh, a different uh, model split and so on, keep staying. But if you think about masks, gloves, and uh, I don't know, something else, I hope they are stopping. So, it's a very, uh, let's say, local question. Since we have uh, deputy mayors and uh, offices working for public transport, this is, uh, this is quite an occasion, an opportunity to uh, reserve some room for that. I loved the, the picture of Karen uh, dealing with the life-changing moments, but since public transport is now suffering from that, I hope that many of the things that are happening with public transport are uh, going away as soon as possible. And Karen, if I may also ask you the uh, same question relative to um, how can we foresee whether these changes to public transport uh, will remain or will just be temporary? Um, well, I can only support what Tommaso says, that we hope we can go back to normal as soon as possible. And I think at some point we simply will ha not have a chance. I mean, public transport is the backbone of our urban mobility systems. And we can temporarily try to relieve the pressure by, by bringing in other modes which are also sustainable. But never will they be able to carry the massive numbers of passengers that uh, public transport is, is able to, to carry. And also it's, it's an issue of affordability and equity. We are also entering a massive economic crisis and pe many people have no alternative but then to use public transport and secondly our cities would completely choke if if all those people who are currently on public transport or used to be on public transport would move to the private car for example so that simple necessity and and those simple facts will also um, make it unavoidable that we return to uh, using public transport more again than we uh, have at the at the current moment and then when it comes to temporary measures becoming permanent that links into what i mentioned with regard to the, the triggers and the fact that those measures which are currently temporary uh, in a good way uh, are often part of long-term visions anyway we had already initiated the process of giving the streets back to the people and making our cities more sustainable. I think now we have an opportunity to make that happen even faster and public transport has a clear role to play and needs to be prioritized through uh, pop-up bus, um, bus lanes for example as well which also will make it more competitive versus the, the private car. Thank you Karen. Um, our next question um, goes to Lee and I know Lee has uh, uh, tried to respond to parts of the question here and uh, Lee in your opinion 
what is the use a road operator can have with the uh, index, uh, particularly, I believe it's the social index, and this kind of data in their day-by-day -day activities. And uh, as a follow-up, have you compared the timing of various states um, uh, through executive orders and guidance to changes in mobility? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you for the question. I, I, you know, I did a type and an answer, uh, written answer in the uh, chat bar as well. So I'm sure there are other use cases of mobility data, social distance data for road operators elsewhere that I'm not aware of. Uh, just the, the use cases I know that people are using data from our platform in the U.S. Uh, include using the data to try to figure out if this is actually the probably the most number of use cases is really on using mobility data to estimate and forecast volumes on a roadway as well as a future revenue. You know, everybody try to understand, at least in the U.S., how the pandemic is going to affect the gas tax revenue, toll revenue, both right now and uh, in, you know, in, in, in the longer term. So there is a lot of uh, use uh, for that. And then, there are, you know, people are also looking at the traffic accidents, uh, both vehicle accidents as uh, also the accidents between vehicles and uh, pedestrians and bikes. And certainly these numbers have gone down because very few, few much, you know, many fewer people are traveling right now, but then they also need mobility data as the exposure because, you know, to, to understand how much fewer people are traveling and then combine that with accident data to try to figure out if, are the roads safer now or not safer now and looking at all these uh, safety operations. And uh, the lot, I mean, the third one that I mentioned, and uh, uh, then also mo just monitoring the changes of who is using the roadway right now. Uh, so uh, of all the vehicles that are still traveling on the roads, uh, who are they? Where they come from? And what kind of trips they're using the roadways for? Just understanding the changing origin destination uh, and other travel patterns of the roadway users uh, is, is another one. So, so I'll just uh, name these three. And, um, um, uh, we, you know, we are linking, trying to understand whether or not the people who are traveling are, are for essential work purposes. But what I can say is that the data already showed that actually still the majority of the trips are not for work purposes. Uh, but just based on a simple analysis we've done, it does seem that most of the work trips, uh, the trips that are still going to workplaces, uh, seem to be consistent with the percentage of non-essential workers as defined by different state governments. Thank you, Lee. Um, the next question will go to all panelists and I'll start uh, with uh, Andre Broto. And it has to do with, um, uh, you know, in some cases, uh, in some countries, public transit continue to operate during the COVID-19 crisis. And um, while in some other areas it has not, but for the majority part, it has been considered an essential service. And um, do you believe there is a correlation between the spreading of COVID-19 and the use of public transit in a town or in a region? Have uh, any data shown any, any of that? Uh, I have no no data on a correlation between uh, the use of public transport and uh, the expansion of COVID. Maybe there is, but I don't know it. Um, so, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, Andrea? Andrea? It would go to Andrea next. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure, perfect. So uh, I have no specific data from Italy. I've, re I've read something scientific paper on this, and there is no specific reference to the correlation between the travel you make in public transport and the COVID uh, emergency, and also the, the possibility to have uh, con to contract the virus uh, COVID-19. So uh, what I can say that I have no reference in Italy, but I found some research. Uh, in Germany about it, and I found that there is no correlation about it. Karen, have you seen any uh, reports relative to this? I haven't seen any data, but I would be surprised if, if there was such a correlation. I mean, uh, there was no crowding on, on, on public transport during this, this um, period. And I really think it's very important that during uh, such uh, lockdown phases also, 
public transport continues to run and is there indeed as an essential service for those who, who need it. But as I said, no data, but I would be surprised if, if there were such a correlation. And um, unfortunately, we've um, uh, Dionisio had to leave. So some of the questions that we have, um, you know, that they relate to the use of public transit, um, uh, you know, will go to uh, everybody. So the next question that we have, it's relative to in, um, in Asian cities such as Singapore and Hong Kong, public transport has continued or has reopened uh, with no social distancing in trains and buses on the grounds uh, that is logistically and economically impractical for transit operators. So use of masks is however mandatory. So it seems to contrast with the approach taken in Europe and the United States. And in your opinion, what are the views on this uh, contrasting uh, proposal? Tommaso, may I ask uh, this question of you, please? Yes. Uh, it's, it's the real task by now, because um, in some places, as I showed you, uh, social distancing on board the vehicles is not uh, binding. And in some other places, it is. As I told you, uh, the pictures I show are from a subway vehicle where you don't see the driver. So the driver is segregated and the passengers are told they can be one close to the other. In the buses in Italy right now, the driver has, uh, let's say, four or five square meters reserved to him or herself just to be uh, segregated driving and the other space is supposed to be under social distancing but it is difficult to, to maintain social distancing on some lines and some uh, timetables so it's the situation that has to be dealt with uh, i i don't know of course i don't know the, the answer to this. In Italy, numbers are going rapidly to be quite positive. So my esteem is that we will uh, somehow uh, flatten social distancing while on board the buses. But it's a very difficult task and I am the one who deals with decisions uh, taken by the politics. I'm not a politic. So it's a very tough question and uh, everyone is making their own uh, uh, job. Thank you, Tommaso. Karen, uh, um, would you like to add anything on this one? I agree with uh, what Tommaso just said. We are dealing with a very high level of uncertainty, which makes everything even more challenging. So we'll, time will tell, I think, but at some point I expect it will be unavoidable that we indeed um, move towards reduced uh, social distancing requirements. Thank you, Karen. Our next question uh, will go to Andrea. And uh, Andrea, we saw that in Italy, uh, where new walking and cycling infrastructure is being implemented. Presumably there have been accelerated procurement procedures put in place. How was this done to be able to do it so quickly? Yeah, sure, because the main uh, uh, work was made the, the using the maintenance co maintenance uh, project. So you know, the generally we have some money that every day and every year was uh, started, was used in order to make new infrastructure, to make this kind of new feature in order to reuse the space and urban roads. We use the sorry the authority, the authority, the municipality use the money for maintenance. And obviously there is also some specific money, but I don't know. Uh, that we arrive from the minister and from the government. So, but now what I know that they use the money they already have for maintaining the roads. Thank you, Andrea. And it's a follow one. Um, there was a question that we had whether the law that was introduced to increase the number of bike lanes, uh, temporary or permanent, or whether it's something uh, that is subject to review after some uh, period of time. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, the idea nowadays in Italy, that is in Bologna and also in Milan, that what was, what was made now, starting from May to July, but also in, during the summer, will be also the same network that we have in the future. So no change in terms of vertical side, horizontal side, type of intersection. Also, uh, the idea is to build up itinerary. No, so in order to have a strictly connected uh, network that uh, doesn't stop in some place and obviously that will be connected with the main uh, um, the main uh, main place such as hospital school university and so on thank you andrea um, next question will go to Lee. Uh, Lee, in some cases, bike lanes are developed and take some space that was allocated to other modes such as bus and cars. And there is a risk that cars will just go elsewhere on other streets that have not been impacted by the, by the project, um, which makes monitoring of this very important. Uh, how can data uh, be used in order to track that and any ideas how to uh, work around this problem? Oh, I can, I'll be happy to comment on the data part, but uh, I assume other presenters are much more qualified than me on complete street uh, kind of issues. Uh, um, you know, the, the good thing about mobility big data is really, you know, you can impute modes and uh, uh, the bike, you can impute. So, so essentially from the kind of data we, we work with and uh, quite a few others are also working on, we would have a much clearer picture, much, I mean, a much more clear picture of how many, uh, bi how many biking trips we have uh, everywhere in a city, every intersection, every street, and uh, you know, how many people are using buses when you combine these multimodal very granular level demand data together that provides a very strong decision support on uh, how to optimize and re-optimize the use of existing roadway space. Uh, actually, you know, based on what I'm hearing uh, within U.S. Department of Transportation, this is actually a a, a very you know he, you know uh, heavily discussed policy issue right now. Uh, how to really use data to re-optimize the use of existing roadway space. I, I think uh, mobility data, mobile device data can help because in, in the past, the collecting bike demand data at the street level, intersection level, you know, has been a bit challenging. But, but I, I, you know, I would invite, you know, other presenters to chime in um, on more of the po policy parts of, uh, you know, related to complete street and uh, related issues. Uh, thank you, Lee. And uh, Andre, Andre, and Karen, would you like uh, to comment on the uh, policy issues? And also Tommaso? Yes, Andre, uh, Andre speaking. Uh, maybe one comment on uh, uh, what happened in European uh, countries. I think the, the most important point is that the pandemic was very severe in our countries. It was not the case in Singapore or Hong Kong. So uh, people rely on social distancing. We said them go to home. They, they wanted to go to home, to stay at home. And the most important point for them was if uh, they had something somewhere to go, the most important point was to take an individual transport mode, car or bicycle, and not the public mode because the fare of uh, the social uh, the, of other people, so this is an important point, in my opinion, which explains why we have social distancing in uh, public transport in those countries, and why maybe we don't have it in other countries with uh, a not so severe pandemia. Thank you, Andre. Um, Karen. No further comments from my side. Thanks. And Andrea? Yeah. Sure, also myself, I have no further comments because uh, I think that the idea is that probably is connected, the answer is connected what happens and the experience that each country and each municipality have at, in each region. And so probably the answer is connected to what happens, the, the experience that we have on the side. Okay, uh, Tommaso? I was fascinated by the words I heard before because 
they, they fit well. You know, uh, also in Italy, you have, uh, I don't know, people from China wearing masks because of a cold. So they are like more used to that kind of, they have more confidence maybe, I don't know. That's just, uh, uh, that's a, a motivation stronger than mine because so, so I'm, I, I, I fit to that. Okay. Um, thank you. So one of the things that uh, we keep hearing is that, um, you know, it is expected that many staff would be encouraged to work from home. And um, do we have any serious forecast on, on, on this that, uh, uh, that we see? Um, Karen? Well, I can only look at my own experience. Uh, the police office has gone uh, fully virtual uh, mid-March, basically, and uh, it's still the case. And uh, I expect that that for us, as well as other many other em employers, uh, part of that will stick. I mean, a combination of, of working from home with uh, being at the office is probably becoming the standard in the future, I would say. And uh, thank you, Karen. So, um, Andre, the next question is for you. Um, we've also seen the need for leadership and good internet connections and um, public-private partnerships with many examples from high-income countries working well during this time. But um, what about the low- and middle-income countries? Are there any good examples that can be inspirational as people are working from, from home or, um, you know, teleworking is a question for Andre Bruto uh, yes please yes um, we, 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 we had interesting presentations from uh, countries of uh, South Africa from Africa Morocco etc uh, on a PR webinar um, I have not in mind the, the answers, but uh, we notice that, uh, for example, they have less, uh, the impact of the pandemic is lower, maybe due to the fact that in those countries, the average age of population is lower. Uh, so I, I, I have no, no other, I have not in mind the solutions. Thank you, Andre. Um, a next question, uh, Karen, is for you even, uh, if you have information on that. What short-term future for ride-on-demand and carpooling? Uh, there is a famous ITF reborn on Lisbon that same service can be delivered with only 10% of the vehicles. Are you, uh, is there anything on the short-term future for ride-on-demand and carpooling? I think um, this is something that, that on the one hand fits in with, with my uh, point where I said that we need to, to look at how we can come to better integration of public transport and shared mobility services. Um, also to take some pressure away from public transport, but also with something that we have been saying um, for a long time already. And that is that in those areas where there is uh, generally um, a reduced public transport supply because it's not cost efficient, because uh, we're talking about remote areas or because we're talking about specific target groups that could never, um, which whose needs could never be met by, by public transport, that we need to look at um, public private partnerships again, because it's very often better to establish a partnership with a car sharing company or with a ride hailing company or demand responsive transport services uh, like like via van for example it's better to partner with them than for a public authority to introduce those services themselves or to set them up themselves which are very costly so if you can subsidize trips which are offered by those privately run uh, mobility services um, rather than set them up your own you can come to a situation where there is a business case for the private sector and you as a public authority are also addressing uh, equity needs and making sure that there is mobility um, that there are mobility services available for different target groups for off-peak periods as well as for uh, remote areas thank you Karen um, I'll ask you a next question of uh, Tommaso Andre and Andrea um, starting with Tommaso 
a few days ago in Italy, there was the first accident on the emergency bike lanes created in this time. What kind of strategies do you think the road operator should develop in order to facilitate the new mobility forms? Wow. I'm sorry, I don't know uh, anything about the accident. And uh, of course, that's, uh, that's bad news. But as, as I told you in Germany, but also in Italy, the design of some infrastructures on the street. So uh, I hope that uh, this uh, thing uh, is not going to be bad, but I, I don't know anything about that. Of course, if you design a, a pop-up infrastructure, it has to be fitting with the law, but this is very easy to say. I, I, should, I should know much more about that. Andre? Andre Brotto? Yes. Uh, um, relative to, yeah. you know, yes, what kind uh, of strategies uh, road operators should develop? I'm sorry. Um, first, of course, we need the guides or something like that. In France, the service uh, called CEREMA has published some guides on how to do the design of a bicycle path. I think on the also that, uh, of course, there is a main, uh, a main road network in big cities where it will be difficult. The, the solution for bi uh, cycle paths will need separate lanes, of course, but on the other hand, there is places where uh, the priority is for pedestrians and bicycles and not for cars. So it depends on which type of network you are. And uh, we, uh, th this means what, that we must think the total network as a whole, where we need uh, dedicated pass lanes and where Normally, there is no cars or nearly no, uh, very few cars. And therefore, in those uh, secondary uh, streets, the priority is, for, of course, for pedestrians and, and, and bicycles. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Andrea Simon? Sure, I can say that the idea, the first idea is to try to have the uh, bicycle path and itinerary in the urban center, near the urban center, in rows where the cars and, bus, and buses travel at 30 kilometers per hour. So the idea is to have the same level and no difference between in the, in the carriage and in the, in the that if uh, you have this 30 kilometers per hour road. Obviously, if the car and uh, tracks and bicycle and bi sorry, and buses uh, speed will be higher and will be with the operating speed that will be higher, probably the best solution to have separate. So what I can say nowadays that the itinerary that was built up is for all road that we nowadays have a 50 kilometer per hour um, uh, the, um, speed limit that will be in the future 30 kilometer per hour. Thank you very much. And Karen, I may ask the same question of you as well relative to what kind of strategies do you think the road operators should develop in order to facilitate the new mobility forms? I think this is linking into three things which, which are not new to, um, to the current situation. First of all, that there is a urgent need for a massive space reallocation in our streets, and we already knew this prior to COVID-19. So we need to give more space to active travel, including uh, new mobility services, uh, such as, as the use of e-scooters e and micro-mobility in general. So this is something that we already desperately needed before um, the current crisis existed. We need to 
more fairly uh, redistribute space and, and give less space to cars and more to cycling and walking and, and related uh, light mobility modes because giving them more space and dedicated infrastructure will also inherently um, make them um, more safe to use. And that links into the second thing. There is another crisis which has not magically disappeared and that's the, the road safety crisis, one of the challenges we had been tackling uh, already before as well and that we need to, to continue to work on by reducing speeds, by providing dedicated infrastructure as was said and then the third point that we had been working already on with our member cities prior to the crisis as well is that we need to regulate these new mobility services in order to make sure that we mitigate the negative externalities linked to it and capitalize on the opportunities they offer the privately driven mobility services are not naturally aligned with public policy goals. So we need to make sure whether it's safety, whether it's in terms of model shift and sustainability, we need to make sure that we align their goals with uh, public um, sustainable mobility goals. And that requires regulatory frameworks. And many of our cities have been working on that and that doesn't change in the current situation. Thank you, Karen. With that, uh, I would like to thank all of our presenters for the excellent material that they shared with us today and the thoughtful uh, discussion that we had. And um, in closing, I would also like to ask Patrick one last question relative to what else is uh, PR planning uh, in order to support um, the efforts of road operators for um, during this time. Patrick? Thank you. Thank you very much, Christos, and I would like to add my thanks uh, to all our panelists uh, today uh, for having made themselves available and for having shared their insights. That's really appreciated, and we see, uh, obviously, that so much is needed. Uh, we, we need uh, strategic thinking, we need incentives. We also probably need education for people who are going to work from home or to ride bicycles. So there are excellent op opportunities for organizations such as uh, police, UITP, PRC and others, and all our panelists and audience members today to start thinking or to continue thinking about how they can contribute to that massive shift that's underway. So with this in mind, let me, well, you've seen the disclaimer before, let me highlight the next steps. So we will publish the video recording of this webinar as well as PDF versions of the presentation so that you can access all the web links that were highlighted uh, during the webinar today. We're planning future PIARC webinars. Uh, two weeks from now, we will have one on intelligent transport systems, technology solutions for, uh, for the COVID-19, post-COVID-19 uh, uh, transportation needs. And two weeks later, beginning of July, another webinar on the workforce impacts of 2019, COVID-19 uh, on a workforce uh, for road operators and administrations. As you see, we've published notes with the findings from our webinars, and we're now planning an in-depth report, which is scheduled for August. The web link here on the screen uh, that you will find on the PDF uh, file later uh, is uh, a link to a web page that we have created specifically for all this uh, type of, of information. And we have included uh, uh, material from uh, UITP and from uh, police there, uh, by the way. Well, thank you very much to everyone. If you want to contribute further, there are two polls open. Uh, they've been open for quite some time now. They're, they are, you can contribute issues that you would like uh, PR to work about. And you can also volunteer as a stakeholder who would like to share his or her practice. That's, that will be really welcome. Uh, having said that, congratulations to the team I'm working with, uh, PR's response team, uh, excellent colleagues, and Please check our website, chalk.org, and keep safe. Thank you very much, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Christos. Thank you, everyone.